Speak up, guys. Today I bring you an exciting story full of twists and turns. Let's hear the story of Cassidy Morgan, a woman who faced a devastating near-death experience and came back to tell everything she saw and felt on the other side. This story will move you. Before we start, I want to know what city you are watching from. Comment below, and if you're not yet subscribed to the channel, take the opportunity to subscribe now and activate the bell so you don't miss any content like this. Hello, my name is Cassidy Morgan. I never imagined that one day I would be here telling this story. For a long time, I kept what happened that fateful night with me. Not because I was afraid of what people would think, but because it took me a while to process everything myself. How can we explain something that goes beyond our everyday understanding? How can we put into words an experience that challenges everything we think we know about life and death? But today, I feel like the time has come to share. I'm not a writer or motivational speaker. I'm just an ordinary woman who went through something extraordinary. A mother who found strength where she didn't know it existed. A person who died and came back with a purpose. My story is not just about an attack or a near-death experience. It's about real death and an unexpected return. It's about discovering that life has layers that we can't even imagine, and that sometimes we need to hit rock bottom to see the light. Before all this happened, I led a life that many would consider normal. I had my ups and downs, like everyone else. She was the mother of Caleb, my beloved son who, since he was eight years old, had used a wheelchair. I was married to Elias, in a relationship that I believed to be solid, until I discovered a betrayal that shook the foundations of my life. I'm not going to lie. The months leading up to that night were hell. I felt physically and emotionally exhausted. My left arm ached constantly, a pain that no one seemed to understand or take seriously. It was like my body was alerting me to something, but I was too busy trying to keep it all together to pay attention. And then, on a night that started like so many others, everything changed. That's when I crossed the line between life and death and came back to tell the story. I don't expect everyone to believe what I'm about to report. I know that for many, it may seem impossible or a figment of imagination. But I can guarantee that every word I will share is true, at least as I lived and felt it. This is my story. The story of how I died and came back to life. How I saw hell and glimpsed the future. How I discovered that sometimes you have to lose everything to find a new purpose. I hope that, in some way, my experience can touch you, make you reflect on life, on love and on the choices we make every day. So, if you're ready, come with me on this journey. A journey that begins with pain and ends with hope. A journey through death and back to life. Everything started to fall apart months before that fateful night. I was living in a marriage that felt like a sham, trying to pick up the pieces of a broken trust. Elias, the man with whom I had shared years of my life, the father of my child, had betrayed not only our marriage, but my closest friendship. The discovery of the betrayal was like a punch in the stomach. It wasn't just the fact that he was involved with another woman, but the fact that this woman was my best friend, the person I trusted, with whom I shared my joys and sadness, and to make matters worse, she was pregnant. The news spread quickly. Suddenly, my pain, which was already unbearable, became a public spectacle. I saw the looks of pity. I heard the whispers when I passed by. My intimate life, my suffering. Everything was exposed for everyone to see and comment on. Around this time, my left arm started to hurt constantly. It was a strange pain, a mix of numbness and weakness. Sometimes I felt like I was carrying the weight of the world in that arm. But with everything that was going on, he barely had time to think about it. Besides, who would believe it? Everyone was too busy talking about the cheating scandal. And in the midst of all this chaos, there was Caleb, my son. Since the age of eight, he was confined to a wheelchair. Seeing my boy struggle every day with his limitations broke my heart. I was always afraid that he wouldn't be able to have an ordinary life. That his opportunities would be limited. Little did I know that destiny had surprises in store for both of us. Elias, in turn 
seemed determined to make things right after he discovered that the child my ex-best friend was carrying was not his. He begged for forgiveness, swore that he had changed, that he wanted to rebuild our family. But how can you rebuild something that has been completely destroyed? His every attempt to get closer only made the wound open wider. The love I once felt for him was turning into bitter resentment. I couldn't look at him without remembering the betrayal, the humiliation. Every word of affection sounded false to my ears. I felt trapped. Trapped in a marriage that no longer existed. Trapped in a life that I didn't recognize as mine. I wanted a way out, but I didn't know how to find it. I was physically and emotionally exhausted. My body hurt. My soul was in pieces. I didn't know it at the time, but I was heading towards a breaking point. Something needed to change, and the universe was about to intervene in ways I could never have imagined. The night that would change everything was approaching, and I was unknowingly preparing myself for a journey that would go beyond the boundaries of life and death. That night started like so many others. I was trying to find some normalcy, an escape from the constant tension that had become my life. I decided to play poker with some friends. It was a welcome distraction, a time when I could pretend that things were okay, that I was just Cassidy, not the betrayed woman, not the worried mother, just me. The game flowed, the laughs were genuine, and for a few precious moments, I managed to forget everything. It was like breathing fresh air after being submerged for a long time. But, as always happens when things seem to get a little better, reality came pulling me back. Elijah appeared. He always knew how to interrupt any moment of peace I managed to find. He was visibly drunk, his eyes were red, his breath betraying that he had drunk more than he should have. He insisted that I come home with him. At that moment, I felt a mixture of emotions. Anger at him for invading my space. Fear of what could happen if I didn't give in. And a deep exhaustion from having to deal with all of this. For some reason that I still can't fully explain, I agreed to go. Maybe it was the tiredness of constantly fighting. Maybe a part of me still wanted to believe that there was a chance for redemption, that maybe, just maybe, things could get better. Or maybe it was just the desire to get the situation over with and go home to my son. Elias, in his drunken state, insisted that I drive his new car. It was a vehicle I had never driven before, and the idea of being in control of something unfamiliar made me even more nervous. But once again... I gave in. It seemed easier to agree than to argue. We got into the car, and the silence that followed was heavy, filled with unresolved tension and unspoken words. The way home never seemed so long. I could feel Elias gaze on me, but I refused to take my eyes off the road. My fingers gripped the steering wheel so hard my knuckles turned white. It was then that Elijah decided to break the silence. He started talking about our marriage about how he wanted things to go back to the way they were before. His words were a confused mix of regret and accusations. One moment he asked for forgiveness, the next he blamed me for not being able to get over what had happened. And then, in a gesture that would change everything, he reached for my hand, not with affection but with drunken, dangerous determination. He grabbed my finger and began pulling on my diamond ring, the same ring he had given me years ago, a symbol of a love that now seemed so distant. Instinctively, I resisted. That ring, despite everything, still meant something to me. Not love for Elijah, but a memory of who I used to be, of the woman who believed in love and fidelity. I pulled my hand back, and that was the moment everything fell apart. Elijah's face contorted into an expression I had never seen before. It was anger, frustration, and something else something dangerous. Before I could react, he lunged at me. And just like that, in a matter of seconds, my life was about to change forever. It all happened so fast that I barely had time to process it. One moment I was driving, trying to maintain control of the situation, and the next, Elias was on top of me, his body pressing mine against the driver's seat. His arms immobilized me with a strength I didn't know he possessed. The smell of alcohol on his breath was suffocating. His eyes, which I once thought reflected love, were now filled with a fury that terrified me to my core. I tried to scream, 
but the sound caught in my throat when I felt his forearm pressing against my neck. The pressure was overwhelming. I couldn't breathe. My lungs burned, desperate for air. My hands, which had released the steering wheel at the time of the attack, Indio were now frantically clawing at Elias' arms, trying to push him away. But it was useless. He was much stronger, and the alcohol seemed to have amplified that strength. My vision started to get blurry. Black dots danced before my eyes. I could hear my heart beating in my ears, a deafening sound that seemed to count down the seconds I had left. It was a terrible feeling, feeling my own body fighting against me, begging for oxygen I couldn't provide. At that moment, a million thoughts ran through my head. I thought of Caleb, my beloved son. Who would take care of him if I wasn't here anymore? How would he deal with this loss in his life already full of challenges? I thought about my parents, my friends. I thought about all the things I still wanted to do, all the words I hadn't said, all the dreams I hadn't fulfilled. And then, when I thought I couldn't take it anymore, when my body started to give up the fight, something strange happened. It was as if a curtain had been lifted. Suddenly the pain, the fear, everything disappeared. I felt weightless, like I was floating. For a moment I thought I had passed out, but then I realized I could see everything clearly. I could see Elias on still pressing my body against the seat. I could see my own face, pale and lifeless. But I wasn't there anymore. I was out, floating above the scene, watching everything as if it were a movie. I watched as Elijah finally realized what he had done. I saw the panic in his eyes as he let go of my neck and started shaking me, screaming my name. But I couldn't answer. My body was there. But I... I was somewhere else. It was at that moment that I understood. I hadn't just passed out or lost consciousness. I had died. The realization should have scared me. But strangely, I felt no fear. Instead... I felt a peace I had never experienced before. And then, just when I thought I had seen it all, something even more incredible happened. A light, brighter and more beautiful than anything I had ever seen, began to envelop me. It was warm, welcoming, filled with a love I didn't even know existed. And I knew, with a certainty I couldn't explain, that my journey was just beginning. Enveloped in that indescribable light, I felt myself being pulled away from the car, from Elijah, from my lifeless body. It was as if I was floating, but at the same time, being guided by a gentle and loving force. There was no fear. There was no pain. Just a feeling of peace and welcome that I had never experienced before. As I walked away from the scene of the attack, I noticed my perception was changing. I was no longer limited by my physical senses, it was as if I could see, hear, and feel everything around me simultaneously. The colors were more vibrant, the sounds were clearer, and I could feel the energy of everything around me. I suddenly found myself in a place that I cannot fully describe with words. It was like I was everywhere and nowhere at the same time. Time did not exist as we know it. Past, present, and future seemed to merge into a single reality. In this state, I began to understand things that previously seemed impenetrable mysteries. It was as if all the knowledge in the universe was available to me. I understood the purpose of life, the meaning of love, the interconnectedness of all things. I understood that every decision we make, every action we take, has an impact on the great fabric of existence. I saw my entire life unfold before me not as a linear sequence of events, but as a complex, interconnected mosaic. I could see how each experience, each relationship, each challenge had shaped me. I saw the opportunities lost and the lessons learned. But there was no regret, only understanding and acceptance. In the midst of this transcendental experience, I felt a presence. I can't say it was a being in the traditional sense, but it was a consciousness, an energy of unconditional love so powerful that it made me feel completely safe and loved. This presence guided me, showed me things, helped me understand. I communicated with this presence, but not with words. It was an exchange of thoughts, of feelings, of pure understanding. 
I asked about the meaning of life, about the reason for suffering, about what happens after death. The answers came not as explanations but as direct revelations, as if I had always known the truth, but was only now able to access it. I understood that life on earth is a school, a place of learning and growth, that the difficulties and challenges we face are opportunities for evolution, that love is the most powerful force in the universe, capable of transcending even death. In this state of expanded understanding, I thought about Elijah and what he had done, but instead of anger or resentment, I felt compassion. I saw your own pain, your fears, your insecurities. I understood that his actions, as terrible as they were, came from a place of deep suffering and confusion. It didn't justify what he did, but it allowed me to see beyond the act, to the wounded soul behind it. I thought of my son, Caleb, and felt a love so deep that it seemed to expand infinitely. I saw how his life, with all its challenges, had a greater purpose, how he was destined to touch many lives, to teach lessons of courage and perseverance. As I absorbed all these revelations, I felt I was faced with a choice. I could continue in this state of bliss, of total understanding, or I could return. The decision was not easy. Part of me wanted to stay, to dive deeper into this experience of infinite love and knowledge. But then something happened that changed everything. A vision that showed me that my journey on earth was not yet complete. A vision that gave me a new purpose and the strength to face what came next. As I floated in this state of expanded consciousness, absorbing universal truths and feeling connected to everything, something extraordinary happened. Suddenly my attention was drawn to a scene unfolding before me, as if I were watching a movie from the future. In this vision I saw Caleb, my son, who I had left in a wheelchair, was standing, not just standing, but walking with confidence. He looked older, maybe in his early twenties. His face, which I knew so well, was lit up with a smile that radiated happiness and fulfillment. Beside him, there was a young woman. They walked hand in hand, exchanging looks full of love and complicity. I realized that she was his wife, and my heart was filled with joy to see my son experiencing such deep and true love. The scene changed, and now I saw them in a welcoming home. Caleb was sitting on the floor, playing with two small children. Your children, my grandchildren. The children laughed and shouted, Daddy! As Caleb hugged them and spun them around in the air, the joy that emanated from this scene was palpable. I saw Caleb in an office, working on something that looked very important. He was surrounded by books and papers, and his face showed an expression of intense concentration. I realized that he had become a respected professional, someone who made a difference in people's lives. The vision continued to unfold, showing me flashes of Caleb's future. I saw him giving talks to large audiences, inspiring people with his story of overcoming. I saw him receiving awards, being recognized for his contributions to society. I saw him growing old, surrounded by a loving family and loyal friends. In every scene, in every moment, Caleb radiated an inner strength, a determination and a joy for life that moved me deeply. This was the future I always dreamed of for him, but never believed possible due to his condition. As I watched these scenes, I understood the reason for this vision. It was a reminder, a call. My son needed me, not just now in his childhood, but in the years to come. I had a crucial role to play in his journey, in his transformation from a boy in a wheelchair to the fulfilled and happy man I saw before me. At that moment, I felt absolute certainty. I needed to go back. No matter how painful or difficult it was, I had to return to life for Caleb. He would need me to face the challenges ahead, to believe in himself when the world doubted, to never give up on his dreams. The vision began to fade, but the feeling it left in me remained. It was a mix of hope, determination, and unconditional love. I knew the path wouldn't be easy, that there would be obstacles and moments of doubt, but now I had a clear purpose, a reason to fight. As the last image of Caleb faded, I felt ready to face whatever came next. I was ready to return, to be the mother Caleb needed, 
to help him realize the bright future I had envisioned. But before I could return, there was one more journey I needed to make. A journey to a place I never imagined existed. A place that would forever change my understanding of life and death. Just when I thought my experience couldn't get any more intense, I felt an abrupt shift. The welcoming light that surrounded me began to dissipate, and a dense, oppressive darkness took its place. It was like I was being pulled down into a place that defied everything I believed I knew about existence. Suddenly, I found myself in an environment that I can only describe as hellish. It wasn't the hell of the movies or books, with demons with horns and tridents. It was something much more visceral, much more real and frightening. The air was heavy, suffocating, filled with a smell that mixed sulfur and despair. The temperature fluctuated between biting cold and unbearable heat. All around me I saw souls in agony. They were not physical bodies, but ethereal forms that writhed in pain, trapped in their own torments. Some of these souls seemed to be burning in flames that did not consume them, but made them suffer eternally. Others were immersed in a darkness so deep that it seemed to suck away all hope. There were those who relived their worst moments over and over again, trapped in an endless cycle of guilt and regret. The sound was deafening. Screams of anguish, cries of despair, pleas for mercy. It was a cacophony of suffering that reverberated throughout the room. As I watched this terrifying scene, I noticed something curious. Some of the souls I saw seemed to have been cremated after death. This observation intrigued me, and I turned to the being of light that still accompanied me, now a faint presence in this dark place. The people who were cremated, is that why they're here? I asked, confused and scared. The answer came not in words, but in direct understanding. Cremation is not a sin. The choice of life is what got them here, not what happened to their bodies after death. This revelation made me reflect deeply. I realized that this place was not a punishment imposed by a cruel deity, but a reflection of each soul's choices and actions during their life. It was as if each person created their own hell, based on their actions, thoughts, and intentions. I saw souls who were there because of the cruelty they had inflicted on others. Others were trapped by their greed, their selfishness, their indifference to the suffering of others. Some seemed to be there simply because they couldn't forgive themselves, trapped in a cycle of self-punishment. As I watched, I felt an overwhelming compassion for these suffering souls. I understood that many of them were not aware that they could choose to leave. They were so stuck in their patterns of thinking and behavior that they couldn't see a way out. At that moment, I thought about Elijah. I thought about what he had done to me, the act of violence that brought me here. But instead of feeling anger or a desire for revenge, I felt deep sadness. I understood that if he didn't change his path, this could be his destiny. The hell experience taught me a powerful lesson about personal responsibility and the consequences of our actions. I understood that every decision we make, every word we say, every action we take, has the power to lift us up or drag us down. When I finally felt myself being pulled away from this terrible place, I took with me a new understanding about the nature of good and evil, heaven and hell. I understood that these are not physical places, but states of consciousness that we create with our choices. This visit to hell, frightening as it was, strengthened my determination to return to life. I knew I had an important mission, to not only care for Caleb and help him realize his potential, but also to live in a way that inspires others to make better choices, to be more compassionate, to seek the light even in the darkest moments. With this new understanding and purpose, I felt ready for what came next returning to life, and all the challenges that would entail. After the intense journey through hell, I felt a gentle force pulling me back. It was as if an invisible thread was guiding me back to my body, back to the life I had left behind. The transition was gradual, but at the same time, it seemed to happen in the blink of an eye. Suddenly, the expanded consciousness I had experienced began to compress. The universal truths that seemed so clear began to dissipate like mist at dawn. It was like trying to hold water with your hands. 
The more I tried to hold on to that knowledge, the more it slipped through my fingers. And then, in an instant, I was violently pulled back into my body. The feeling was overwhelming. If before I felt light and without limits, now my body felt like a prison of flesh and blood. Every nerve screamed, every muscle ached. The contrast between the peace I had experienced and the physical pain I now felt was shocking. My lungs burned as I struggled to breathe. It was as if I had forgotten how to do something as basic as breathing in and out. My chest hurt, probably from the resuscitation attempts. Every beat of my heart felt like a Herculean effort. I opened my eyes, and the reality around me seemed strange, almost alien. Colors seemed less vibrant, sounds muffled. It was as if I was seeing the world through a veil, a pale shadow of the reality I had experienced on the other side. Elijah was still there, his face a mask of shock and fear. He was holding me, shaking me, screaming my name. His hands on me repulsed me. The man I once loved, who had almost taken my life, now seemed like a stranger. I tried to speak, but my throat was dry and sore. The words came out as a hoarse whisper. Let me go. Elias didn't seem to hear or didn't want to hear. He continued to physically manipulate me, as if he could somehow undo what he had done. His actions, which he likely saw as an attempt to help, to me were an additional violation. With strength I didn't know I had, I managed to push him away. My body protested at the sudden movement, but I ignored the pain. Adrenaline coursed through my veins giving me the energy I needed at that crucial moment. I staggered out of the car, my feet unsteady on the cold ground. The night air hit my face and I breathed it in deeply, savoring each breath as if it were the first and last. My senses felt heightened and dull at the same time. The smell of wet grass, the distant sound of a dog barking, the streetlights flickering, it all felt familiar and strange at the same time. Elias got out of the car behind me, his voice a mix of panic and pleading. Cassidy, please let me help you. I'm so sorry, I don't know what came over me. His words were like knives in my ears. I turned to face him, and what I saw shocked me. He was no longer the man I feared moments ago. Now, in light of what I had experienced, he seemed small, pathetic, broken. I could see the fear in his eyes, the remorse, the confusion. For a moment, I felt a pang of compassion, remembering what I had learned about the hell we created for ourselves. But then, the reality of what he had done hit me again. The imprint of his hand still burned on my neck. The memory of suffocation, despair, death. Everything came back like a wave. Don't come closer to me, I managed, my voice firmer than I expected. It's over, Elijah. It's all over. He took a step toward me, his hand outstretched as if he wanted to touch me. Instinctively, I backed away. Please, Cassidy, we can talk about this. I can change, I promise. At that moment, something inside me broke. All the anger, all the fear, all the frustration that I had bottled up for so long exploded. To change, I shouted, my voice echoing in the silent street. You almost killed me, Elijah. No, you killed me. I died in that car. He looked at me confused, not understanding what I was saying. How could I? How could I explain the journey I had just taken, the death I had experienced, the hell I had seen? You don't understand, I continued, the words pouring out of me like a torrent. I've seen things you can't imagine. I've understood truths you can't understand. And you know what I've learned, that this, I gestured between us, isn't love. It never was. Elias stood there, paralyzed, as I vented years of hurt and resentment. I talked about his betrayal, about how he had broken not just our marriage but my confidence and my self-esteem. I talked about the weight I had carried, trying to keep our family together at the expense of my own happiness. And then, I talked about Caleb, about the vision I had of him, about the bright future that awaited him. Our son is going to do amazing things, Elijah. He's going to overcome all obstacles. He's going to inspire people. He's going to find true love. And I need to be here to see that happen. I need to be here to help him get there. 
As I spoke, I felt a strength grow within me. It wasn't anger. It wasn't resentment. It was determination. Purpose. I knew, with a certainty that came from the depths of my soul, that my life had changed forever that night. It's over, Elias, I repeated, calmly, this time. I'm leaving, and you won't stop me. You won't follow me. You won't try to contact me. If you really want to change, do it away from me and Caleb. He stood there, defeated, as I walked away. I heard the sound of something falling to the floor, my diamond ring, which he was still holding. I didn't look back. It didn't need to. That chapter of my life was over. I walked down the dark street, my aching body protesting with each step, but my mind was clear, my heart light. I had died that night, yes, but he had also been reborn, and now he had a new life ahead of him, a life with purpose, with true love, with the chance to make a difference. As I walked into the unknown, I felt a peace I hadn't experienced in years. I knew the path ahead would not be easy. There was much to be done, much to be healed. But for the first time in a long time, I was looking forward to the future, because now I knew, really knew that life is precious, that every moment is a gift, and that love, true love, is the most powerful force in the universe. And with this knowledge, I was ready to face any challenge that came my way. The days, weeks, and months that followed that fateful night were a roller coaster of emotions and challenges. My journey of recovery has not just been physical, but deeply emotional and spiritual. Physically, my body took time to recover from the trauma. My throat had hurt for weeks, a constant reminder of what had happened. I had difficulty swallowing, speaking, sometimes even breathing. The bruises on my neck took a long time to fade, as if my body refused to forget so easily. But the physical pain, as uncomfortable as it was, was just the tip of the iceberg. The real challenge was dealing with the emotional and psychological scars that the attack had left. For the first few days, I could barely sleep. Every time I closed my eyes, I relived those terrible moments in the car. The panic, the feeling of suffocation, the darkness that engulfed me. Everything came back with frightening clarity. I sought professional help, knowing I couldn't face all of this alone. The therapy sessions were crucial to my recovery. It was difficult at first, reliving the trauma, talking about my deepest fears. But slowly, I began to process what had happened, not just the attack, but the entire near-death experience. Talking about my journey beyond life was particularly challenging. How can we explain something so profound, so transcendental, using earthly words? I feared that my therapist would think I was crazy that she would dismiss my experience as a hallucination caused by a lack of oxygen. But to my surprise and relief, she listened with an open mind, helping me integrate this extraordinary experience into my everyday life. One of the hardest parts of recovery was dealing with conflicting feelings about Elijah. On the one hand, there was anger, fear, and a deep sense of betrayal. On the other, I remembered the compassion I felt during my experience the understanding that his actions came from a place of pain and confusion. Balancing these feelings, finding a path to forgiveness without compromising my safety and well-being, was a long and often painful process. Caleb has been my anchor throughout this entire process. In the first few days after the incident, he was scared and confused. He didn't understand why we were suddenly living at my sister's house, why his father wasn't around anymore. I tried to explain it as best I could, in a way that a child could understand, without overwhelming them with traumatic details. Seeing Caleb's resilience, his ability to adapt to our new reality, inspired me. I remembered the vision I had of his future, and it gave me strength in the most difficult times. I began to focus not just on my own recovery, but on how I could help him realize his full potential. Little by little, I began to rebuild my life. I found a new place for us to live, a small but cozy apartment. I went back to work, although at first it was difficult to concentrate, to deal with the curious questions from colleagues, the pitying looks. But each day got a little easier. 
One of the most significant changes was my new perspective on life. After having experienced death, every moment seemed precious. The little things that once went unnoticed, Caleb's smile, the warmth of the sun on my skin, the taste of my morning coffee, were now sources of joy and gratitude. I started meditating regularly, trying to reconnect with that sense of peace and unity I experienced during my journey. I didn't always succeed, of course. There were days when the reality of everyday life seemed so far removed from that transcendental experience that I wondered if I had imagined it all. But then, in the calmer moments, I felt that connection again, that certainty that there was something beyond this life. My relationship with spirituality has changed profoundly. I didn't adhere to any specific religion, but I developed a deep faith in the goodness of the universe, in the interconnectedness of all things. I began to see every challenge as an opportunity for growth, every interaction as a chance to spread love and compassion. As the months passed, I felt like I was not just recovering but transforming. The woman who emerged from this healing process was stronger, wiser, more compassionate. I had faced my deepest fears, looked death in the eye, and returned with a new purpose. I knew there was still a long way to go. Healing, after all, is not a destination, but an ongoing journey. There would be difficult days, moments of doubt and fear, but now I had the tools to face them. I was certain that no matter what happened, I was stronger than any challenge life could throw at me. And so day after day, step by step, I continued my journey. Not just recovery, but rediscovery, rebirth. A journey that began on that terrible night, but has taken me to places I never imagined existed, both inside and outside of myself. Today, years after that night that changed everything, I look back and barely recognize the person I was. The near-death experience was not just an isolated event in my life. It was a watershed moment, a catalyst for profound and lasting transformation. The first and most obvious change was in my relationship with Caleb. The vision I had of his future became my compass, guiding every decision I made regarding him. I began to see beyond his physical limitations, focusing on his unlimited potential. I encouraged him to dream big, to never settle for less than he was capable of achieving. And Caleb, he surprised me every step of the way. I saw an inner strength in him that I hadn't noticed before. He faced each challenge with a determination that inspired me daily. When doctors suggested a new experimental therapy that could help him regain some mobility, Caleb was the first to say yes, without hesitation. The process was long and often painful. There were days of frustration, of tears, of wanting to give up. But whenever discouragement threatened to overwhelm us, I remembered that vision. I remembered Caleb as an adult, walking, smiling, living a full and happy life, and that gave us strength to continue. Seeing Caleb take his first unsupported steps years later was one of the most emotional moments of my life. It wasn't a miracle, it was the result of years of hard work, perseverance, and unshakable faith. At that moment, I completely understood why I had to go back, why the universe gave me a second chance. My perspective on life and death has completely changed. Death, which used to terrify me, is now something I face with serenity. Not that I want to die, far from it. My experience taught me just how precious life is. But now I know that death is not the end. It is a transition, a passage to another state of existence. This realization has transformed the way I live each day. I started to value every moment, every interaction. I learned to forgive more easily, to judge less. After all, Having seen the hell we create for ourselves with our negative actions and thoughts, I understand the importance of cultivating love, compassion, and forgiveness. My career also took an unexpected turn. I began sharing my story, first in small support groups, then in larger talks. I discovered that my experience could bring comfort and hope to people who were going through difficult times. I didn't become a spiritual guru or anything like that. That was never my goal. But if my story could help someone find strength in times of darkness, I felt I had a duty to share it. As for Elijah, it took me a long time to truly forgive him. We never had a close relationship again, and he remained distant from Caleb's life for many years. But eventually, 
When Caleb was a teenager and expressed a desire to reconnect with his father, I didn't object. I saw this as an opportunity for Caleb to practice the forgiveness and compassion that I valued so much. Caleb's reunion with Elijah was a healing moment for all of us. I saw Elijah as a changed man, someone who had faced his own demons and emerged stronger 